Hello and welcome back to Functional Analysis. And as always, many, many thanks to all the nice people that support me on Steady or PayPal. We've reached part 15 of our course and will go further into the discussion of operators. In particular, we will start talking about linear operators between Hilbert spaces. And for them, I can show you a lot of applications later, which justify why we study linear operators at all. But before doing that, I want to show you the so-called Wies representation theorem. This one will make our life easier when we deal with Hilbert spaces. Now we call a Hilbert space is an f-vector space with a whole geometry hidden in its inner product. Moreover, together with the induced metric, x is a complete metric space. And then let's look at any continuous linear map from x to f. In other words, it's a bounded linear operator with values in f, as we had it in the last example. Usually one simply calls that a functional. Now the claim is that for each such continuous linear functional, we find a vector x l in x, such that we can write the linear functional as an inner product. Which means that each linear bounded functional has to look like this. Moreover, we have that the operator norm of L is exactly the norm of XL. Where of course the norm in X is the induced norm coming from the inner product. And this is now the important Wies representation theorem which only holds in Hilbert spaces. So please remember that in this way, no matter which crazy linear functional you choose, as long as it's bounded, you can simplify it through this inner product with a fixed vector XL and even the norm is saved here. So we can do a lot when we are working in a Hilbert space. In addition, this theorem is the reason why in physics you often see a linear functional written with a vector psi in this sense. It simply means the same thing. If you apply a vector here from the right hand side, you apply it here in the inner product. Hence the so-called Dirac notation from physics really comes from the Wies representation theorem. Indeed, we can make the claim a little bit stronger because actually there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the continuous linear functionals and the vectors in X. So we should write down there is exactly one XL such that this equation holds. However, now when writing down the proof of the theorem, we have to do two steps. First, showing that there exists such an XL and then showing their uniqueness. So let's start with the existence, which is indeed the harder part. So maybe let's first visualize what we want to do. So we have here our space x and on the right hand side we have f. If we think of dimensions you know that f would be one dimensional and x could be any dimension. Now let's look at all the points, all the vectors that are sent to zero, which is a subspace in our vector space x. And you know this is usually called the kernel of the map L. Now we immediately see one trivial case namely when the kernel is the whole space. This means that we have the zero functional there and we don't have any choice other than choosing our x l as the zero vector. Only the zero vector will send every vector in the inner product to zero. With this simple case out of the way, we can now go back to the picture and see that x l should be orthogonal to the whole kernel. Hence the first question we have to answer does the orthogonal complement of the kernel of L contain enough elements? Or does it only contain the zero vector, which wouldn't help us at all? Thankfully we have more than a zero vector, because the kernel here is a closed set. And because in Hilbert spaces we have something we call orthogonal projections. This is something you can easily imagine in finite dimensions, however in infinite dimensions we really need the completeness property of the Hilbert space. However, since we have to put some work into that, I really want to talk about this later. However, what we immediately can see is that the kernel has to be closed. Namely, that is because it's the pre-image of a closed set, the zero vector, and the continuity tells us the pre-image is also closed then. Please recall, continuity means the pre-images of open sets are open, however, with the complements, that translates to the closed sets as well. Now finally we have all the ingredients to define our vector xl. For this let's choose any vector from the orthogonal complement which is not the zero vector. 
So let's call it x hat and maybe we normalize it from the beginning. So the norm of x hat should be exactly 1. And then we just scale our vector to get our xl. So we set that as l of x hat times x hat where we use the complex conjugation here. It will turn out that this one is exactly the correct scaling factor. Now in the next step we will split up a general vector x into two components. One should lie in the kernel of L and the other one should go into the direction of x hat. Ok, so let's start writing that down. For L of x we can rewrite the x by subtracting and adding again the component into the direction of x hat. Again, this is the scaling factor in front of the x hat, which is correctly chosen as we see in the next step. Using the linearity we can split it up into two terms and now we look at the first one and see that we can use the linearity again. Now the term with the x hat will cancel out and then the whole term will vanish. This means that only the second term remains where we should abbreviate the scaling factor maybe with the name lambda. Then in the next step let's pull out this factor and introduce the inner product in some way. One possibility would be just to write the inner product of x hat with x hat because we know this is just one because we have normalized the vector from the beginning. And then we can pull in the factor L of x hat into the first component but then we know we have to use the complex conjugate. And now you understand why we defined xl in this sense before because here it comes in naturally. Now in the next step we pull in the lambda factor into the second component. Here you see we are almost finished because this one is the same as this one with the inner product. However to get the result with Lx we have to do the same trick as before. So subtracting and adding x again. Then we know by the same calculation as before that this one is in the kernel of L. And since xl is in the orthogonal complement the only thing that remains is the inner product with xl and x. This is now exactly what we wanted to show because the equality holds for all x. Ok, then let's go immediately to the uniqueness part. What happens if we have two different xls? Let's assume that xl and xl tilde fulfill both our equality. Here you should see immediately what you can do. You can bring both inner products on one side. Then we have that this inner product is zero no matter which vector you put into the right hand side. In particular you could put in the same vector you have on the left hand side. However by the first rule of the inner product, the inner product is positive definite, you know this only holds for the zero vector. In other words xl and xl tilde are the same vector. Ok so that's the uniqueness part and the only thing that remains is calculating the operator norm. We already know that the operator norm of L can be calculated by looking at the supremum where we only put in unit vectors. As always this makes our life easier because we don't have a fraction involved here. Now we can put in what we already know that L of x is given by the inner product. And then you should see Cauchy Schwarz is our friend here again. So this is less or equal than the norm of xl times the norm of x. Hence we can omit the supremum and the norm of x and it remains this is less or equal than the norm of xl. Ok, so this is one half of the thing we wanted. We have an upper bound, now we need a lower bound. And we always get that by just putting in one unit vector. And a good choice here would be of course the normalized xl. Again, this is the inner product of xl with this vector. And there you see immediately one norm cancels, so only the norm of xl remains. Hence we have our lower bound, which is exactly the upper bound, so we have shown the equality. And that's the end of our proof for today. We have proven the Ries representation theorem. It has a lot of applications we will discuss later, but I already mentioned that it is used in physics a lot. Therefore I hope you are still interested in functional analysis and will watch the next video as well. So thanks for listening and see you next time. Bye.